I want to start off by taking this opportunity to thank Apostle Theo and Dr. Bev for, uh, for the opportunity to allowing me to speak. And I always like to do this. You know, Apostle Theo, I've known him since, or he's known me since I was a baby, uh, since the early 90s, late 80s. And uh, I've learned so much from him. And I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for him and his teaching. And uh, I've listened to hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. So I, it, it's difficult to measure the impact that he's made on my life. So I'm always thankful for this opportunity to get up here and speak. And I want to thank them. Uh, they were watching last night, and uh, I think Apostle they had a good surf yesterday, so they're having a good time in Hawaii. I'm a bit envious. I'd love to be in the water with them, you know, but uh, honored to be here, so I'll surf next week <laughs> or the week after. Anyway, let's pray. Let's stand. Let's pray. Let's get in the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord, for this amazing day. Thank you, Lord, as I speak. Lord, I don't speak for my own ability, but Holy Spirit, you speak through my lips of clay. I thank you, Lord, that I speak of your faithfulness, I speak of your love, and I speak of your goodness. And as I speak, I thank you, Lord, that fear will leave every heart, faith would rise, joy would rise, hope would rise, and every person under the sound of my voice, in the name of Jesus, and everyone in agreement says, Amen. 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 You may all be seated. Well, as we continue with the book of James, we're going to jump right in here this morning to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to start here laying a bit of a foundation. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance. Everybody say endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, say joy, joy. for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The title of my message this morning is An Eternal Attitude. I want to talk with you this morning about having an eternal attitude, an eternal perspective, an eye on the prize. And what is the prize? The prize is the race that God has set before you. What has God called you to do? What is your unique purpose and design? My desire today is to encourage you, to inspire you, to light a fire under your tail. You know, some people need a little fire under the tail to get them moving. A fire under their tail to see you run out of this place running the race that God has set before you with joy. Say, with joy. It is a race that drives you towards eternity. See, for the believer, it is not where we'll spend eternity. But for the believer, it is how we'll spend eternity. In Hebrews chapter 6, the Bible talks about this. It says that the elementary doctrines of Jesus Christ are eternal judgments and rewards. It is an elementary doctrine, eternal judgments and rewards. What do we learn in elementary school? We talk about elementary doctrines. What do you learn? How many of you guys went to elementary school? Not everybody. It's okay. I'll slow it down for you who didn't. What did we learn in elementary school? For those of you who didn't go, you'll find out really quick. What did you learn in elementary school? You learned how to read. You learned how to write. You learned how to add, subtract. What is one plus one? Two. two. For those of you who weren't at elementary school, now you know the answer. One plus one equals two. Two plus two equals? You guys are so smart. Could you imagine going to high school? Could you imagine going to college and trying to learn how to do calculus if you didn't first learn the elementary basics of reading, writing, addition, subtraction? You wouldn't do very well, right? And it's the same thing with our walk with the Lord. If we do not understand the elementary doctrines, the basics, how can we mature in our relationship with God? So we're talking about eternity here because it's an elementary doctrine. We need to have this understanding. We need to have this perspective. Amen? Amen. We need an internal attitude. Why do we need an internal attitude? Well, the world teaches us, and some people need this as well, that we need to have an 80 to 90 year perspective. And some people still need to work on that as well because we got to plan while we're here on earth, right? Some people can't plan for next week or next month. Tap your spouse if I'm talking to them. You guys will get it. 
But the world will teach us that we need an 80 to 90 year perspective. But more than that, we need to have an eternal perspective. We need to see if we have an eternal perspective, we'll endure things that we wouldn't normally endure if we just have an 80 to 90 year perspective. See, the world tells us, go to school, get a good education, get a good job, you know, save up for retirement, retire, have some grandkids and die. And that's life. That's as good as it gets. But for the believer, we need to have an eternal perspective. What has God called you to do? And as you run after your calling, as you run after your race, you are storing up for rewards in heaven. Amen? So let's start off by defining eternity. Would you believe it that if you had to look it up in a dictionary, one dictionary will define eternity as infinite time. Then you go to another dictionary, and it defines it as the state of existing outside of time. Now, let me ask you, why has nobody questioned this? One dictionary says that eternity is infinite time, and another one says that it is the state of existing outside of time. Could you imagine if you looked in a dictionary, and one dictionary said a fish is an animal that lives inside the water, and another dictionary said a fish is an animal that lives outside the water. People would say, this is crazy. The two dictionaries don't agree. But yet nobody challenges eternity. Nobody challenges why the dictionaries don't agree. Why is that? Why? It's because nobody can begin to understand eternity. You cannot begin to understand eternity. If you don't believe me, I'll prove it. In Job 36, 26, it says, no one can begin to understand eternity. <laughs> See how easy that was. The human mind cannot begin to understand eternity. Think about the universe. You ever think about the universe as a kid? And you think about it, where's the end of the universe? What's at the end? Is there a wall? If there's a wall, I used to do What's on the other side of the wall? And if there's something on the other side of the wall, isn't that the universe continuing? What about a bottomless pit? Falling forever. There's two problems there. One is a pit that never ends. It goes down and down and down and it never ends. It keeps going. Second, falling forever, never ceasing to fall. Think about God. God is eternal. Psalms 92 says God is from everlasting to everlasting. I remember I was talking to Amy Rose and she asked me, like, when was God born? I said, he was never born. He always was. Well, how does that work? Well, he, he always was. He never had a mother. He was never born. He just always was. And he always will be. Our minds cannot begin to understand it. But the good news is in Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says that God has put eternity in our hearts. Say, God has put eternity in my heart. God has put eternity in my heart. Say, eternal attitude. Again, for the believer, it is not where we'll spend eternity, but it is how we'll spend eternity. And that is determined by what we do here on earth in this short amount of time that we have here on earth. Amen? So with this foundation, let's jump into the book of James. We're going to go to James chapter 4, verse 13. It says this. It says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there. Carry on business and make money. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. It is a zero time that we are here on earth. It is a mist. In the span of eternity, we are here just for, just for a, a zero time. Verse 15, it says, And said, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. This is a heavy scripture here, right? I didn't hear a lot of amen, amens. I heard some amens. I just made that up. I heard some amens on that one. <laughs> Any amens here? It says you boast in your arrogant schemes. That's kind of painful. See, there are a lot of believers. Was the book of James written to Christians, to believers, or non-believers? To believers. 
There's a lot of believers who make plans. who say, I'm going to move to this city. I'm going to go here. I'm going to start this job. I'm going to change this. I'm going to buy this house. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And we start naming all these things every day that we're going to do. But yet we forget to consult God. We forget to ask him what his plan is, what his purpose is. In the zero time, we can't help but get distracted. Of course we need a plan. We have to plan, right? But when we make plans and we don't first go to God and say, God, how does this line up with the purpose and the plan that you have for my life? This is what the Bible is calling arrogant and evil. That's what the Bible said. I didn't say it. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> then you get believers who make the plans, and then they think they are doing God a courtesy by bringing him the plans and say, God, would you bless my plans? Well, that doesn't work either. It doesn't work. we got to find out what God's plan is, what His will for our life is, and then we plan according to His. Amen? Amen? So I'm going to take a quick detour here. Don't mind me. Everyone say it's a detour. Say, I am extraordinary. Did you know that you're extraordinary? See, God is a good God. We've, that's kind of been the theme for today. God is a good God, right? He's an incredible God. He created the heavens. He created the earth. He made the stars. Everything that you see here, the birds, every animal, he imagined the oceans and he spoke the world into existence. Now imagine a parent who's about to have a child. Natalie and I, we just had a little Kalea Beth here, March 25th. And if you're a parent and you know you're about to have a child, what do you do when you have that child or before you have that child? You go and you prepare a room, you prepare a place, right? You take the room. You paint the walls pink if you know you're having a girl, which we didn't do, which we should have done because we got four now. Anyway, <laughs> and you paint the room, you put the crib together, you put everything together, you get enough diapers that you fill the whole room up with diapers. You can't even walk in there because when those babies are first born, all they do is poop and eat, poop and eat, yeah. poop and eat, right? You prepare a place, but when you come home from the hospital, wherever you're coming from, with that baby, and you walk into that room, how much more valuable is that child than that room? The room cannot for one moment begin to compare in value to the child that you've brought into that room. And I want to tell you that you are valuable. God created you. He created the world. He prepared a place for you. And everything that God did, all the gold, all the mountains, all the oceans, everything that God created was preparing a place for you. But it cannot begin to compare in value to who you are. Say, I am extraordinary. I am unique. So with that in mind, let me tell you that God did not create somebody as incredible, as wonderful, as, as extraordinary as you are for an ordinary, plain Jane, boring, good for nothing life. God created you extraordinary for a unique purpose. Everybody say purpose. purpose. This is what the book of James is talking about. When I'm going to read it again, verse 13. It says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow will go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, while well, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. God's saying, I created you. You're here for a short little amount of time. It really, it's a zero time in the, in the span of eternity. But in the zero time, you're getting distracted. You're running around saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to buy this house. I'm going to move to this city. I'm going to start this business. I'm going to make money here. But God said, I've got you here for a small amount of time. For a unique purpose and plan. Can we stay focused? Can we stay focused? Amen? Amen? Our purpose is God's plan. Verse 15, he says, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Say purpose. purpose. Genesis chapter 12. We look at Abraham here. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country and your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. 
all families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed. So I imagine this, when Abraham departed, anyone ever seen Lion King? And you get Mufasa, and Mufasa takes Simba, right, that's how you say it, Simba, up to this high mountain, right? And they're looking over the land, and Mufasa says to Simba, everything you see is yours. Everything that you see is yours. And I just see that, that that's what God did with Abraham. He said, look across the land. Everything that you see, I'm giving you. Everything that you see, I'm giving you. Now, God called Abraham out of Hebron. Now, Hebron was a worldly place. It was a satanic place full of idol worship. Not a place you'd want your kids to grow up. Right? A bad place. He called him out of Hebron to Canaan. He called him to himself. Out of the world and to himself. And just like you and me, God has called us out of the world and to himself. Now, what was the very next thing that God did after he called Abram out of Hebron and to himself? When he called him out of the world and to himself, the very next thing that God did is God gave him vision. God gave him purpose. God said, this is what I've called you to do. Get your eyes on the prize. Here's the race that I have set before you. Go. Right? I believe that every single one of you, God has put that unique purpose, design, and calling on the inside of your hearts. It's already there on the inside of your hearts. When you say, God's given me purpose. God's given me a plan. God set a race in front of me. Just like Abraham, when God called you to himself, he gave you vision. He gave you purpose. Amen. Everyone say hope. Hope. You've heard this before, I'm sure, but a ship aimed for nothing is bound to hit nothing. Right? It's true. And it's the same thing for our lives. If we are aimed for nothing, we're going to hit nothing. So we've got two choices here in life. One is we can run the race that God has set before us, impact the world for Jesus, shake the world for Jesus. Anyone here want to shake the world for Jesus? This old Delirious song says, I'm going to be a history maker. I want to be a history maker. Any history makers here today? I want to be a history maker. Come on. You want to be a history maker? Not all of you. Come on, get some fire under you. God's called us to be history makers. Don't be discouraged. Don't think I'm no good. God created you extraordinary. You are a history maker if you didn't know it. It's important that we do our part, though. Say, God, I want to do my part. God, I want to do my part. I don't want to do Pastor Luke's part. I want to do my part. Forgot about you. I didn't pick on you enough yet. I was picking on him last night. I'm going to try to pick on you some more. I remember now. I I forgot. Say, God, I want to do my part. I want to do my part. You know, you will not be judged when you get to heaven. You will not be judged according to what you did, but you'll be judged according to what you were called to do. In other words, if God called you to be a pastor or an evangelist and you say, listen, I just don't like the ministry. I got hurt in church, you know, this, blah, 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 blah. I think I could be a good businessman and maybe you can and maybe you can make lots of money and can give lots of money to the church. Cool. That's wonderful. But not really, because when you get to heaven, God's going to say, I called you to be a pastor. Show me what you did. And you say, well, Lord, I didn't really like what you had kind of set for me. So I thought I would just support the gospel by giving all this money. That sounded more fun to me. But I called you to be a pastor. I called you to lead these people to the Lord. I called you to mentor these people. Right? Or imagine a man who's in the pulpit. And he, he does all these great things, preaches all these great messages. And he gets to heaven and says, God, I was a pastor and I served. God said, but I called you to be a businessman. I called you to be in the business world. We don't pick and choose. God has a unique design and purpose for our life. And we need to know what that is. And we need to hook in with that. Amen. Amen. And get back on my notes here. The difference is obedience. Obedience to his purpose. Now, if you're here and you say, I don't know what God has called me to do. I have no idea. Well, I want to tell you that there's not one person that you can find in the Bible that God hid their destiny from them. Not one person. 
God never told one person, hey, you know what? Just go with the flow. Just float down the river like a dead fish and just, you know, you'll, you'll go and you'll be fine. Not one person. I wrote a few names down here. Let's think about Abraham. We just talked about him. Joseph, Moses, John the Baptist, Paul the Apostle, the 12 disciples, Noah, Jonah. Jonah didn't like his plan, but he came around. He came around. And maybe you're in this place and you say, I feel like I'm in the belly of the whale right now. Anyone feel like they're in the belly of the whale? Maybe you've been running from God's plan. Maybe you've been running from his calling. Now, I want to say this. When you are running God's plan, running the race, don't get me wrong. There's going to be challenges. There will be challenges. It's not easy either. Sometimes the things are easy. You know what's easy is floating down a river like a dead fish. That's what's easy too. So if you're waiting for something easy, stop. Just stop. (laughs) But let me say this. Here's the difference. When you're running your race, God's grace will be upon you. His anointing and His grace. It's not always going to be easy, but you're going to have the unction to function. You're going to have the, the drive, let's go. It's hard. I'm kicking down the gates of hell. You know what I'm saying? I'm going. No devil's going to stop me. But when you're in the belly of the whale, it's a little different. You just feel like dying. And if you just feel like dying, let me tell you what. I think you're running from your race. I think you're running in the wrong way. And God's got you in the belly of a whale right now. You got you to repent. You got to get back to what God's called you to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen? God created you extraordinary on purpose for a purpose. I want to say this. When I was five years old, I remember I was in the Blue Waters Hotel, which is in Durban, South Africa. I lived there for a few years. And I remember... My parents had a church. It was on the second floor, and they had this, like, spiral staircase going up. And right at the top of the staircase, I just, I remember clear as day, standing right there, this person comes up to me and asks me, as many people ask kids, what do you want to be when you get old? What do you want to do when you grow up? And out of my mouth came, well, I want to be a worship leader. I want to be a pastor. I want to do business. I don't know. It just was all in me, you know? I knew when I was five years old, God had put it in my heart. And would you believe that's what I'm doing and running with today? God put it in my heart. But if I could say this, I had my moments of doubt. I tell this, I tell it as often as I can tell it, to be honest, because I think it's important is I naturally am a horrible singer. I'm probably one of the worst singers you've ever heard in your life. As a matter of fact, my sister, she could sing really well. And we grew up singing, not together, We both grew up singing, but my parents would say, hey, why don't your sister come up and sing in front of everybody? You can run the sound. For real, when we started our church in Hawaii, I was the sound guy. They wouldn't let me near a microphone. The further away I was from the microphone, the better. I used to clap in church. People came up to me and asked me to stop clapping. I'm bad. I am bad. But God... See, the thing is, many times God will call you in your weakness. God will call you in your weakness. So don't look at yourself and say, but I'm not good at that. Who cares if you're good at it? Who really cares? God's grace will be upon you. Amen? I put this in your notes. If you're following in your notes, self-reliance grieves the Holy Spirit. But faith and reliance on God pleases Him. Amen? 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 So if I'm speaking to you here today and you go, look, I really just have no clue. I don't know what God has called me to do. I'm going to give you a scripture that really helped me. If you need direction in your life, if you need to know your next steps, use this. I've used it many times. Colossians 1.9, and I wrote it out as a prayer. Father God, I thank you that I'm continually receiving the knowledge of your will for my life in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, bearing good fruit, In every good work that I might fully please you in all things. Can we say that together? Say, Father God, I thank you that I am continually receiving the knowledge of your will for my life. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding, bearing good fruit in every good work that I might fully please you in all things. 
You say that over and over again, over and over again, over and over again. Just keep saying it. Just keep speaking it. Just keep declaring it. And God will begin to reveal to you. You'll begin to hear God's voice and say, I know what my next steps are. I know what God has called me to do. I promise you, if you do this, it'll work for you. Amen? Amen. Mark Twain, he said this. He said, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Ask yourself, do I know and am I living God's purpose for my life? Do I know and am I living God's purpose for my life? James chapter 5, pick it back up into the book of James. Therefore, be patient. Everyone say patient. I have to stop on this word, so be patient with me. Patience is hard. We like the word patience. We tell our kids, be patient. Patience is a virtue. But patience is hard. Am I alone? Anybody else know what I'm saying? Patience is hard. It's not easy. It's really hard. I could preach on that. Patience is hard. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Waiting patiently, there it is again, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. I think he's trying to tell us something. Be patient. Establish your hearts. God has put eternity in our hearts. Come on, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. We have to be patient. Now, let me say this. I know nothing about farming. I do not have a green thumb. I think they call it a black thumb. Uh, Natalie loves plants. I kill plants. So with that being said, I do know this, though. If you take an orange seed and you put it in the ground and you come back tomorrow thinking you're going to eat some oranges, you're going to be disappointed. You come back the next day. Could you imagine if you didn't know? You come back the next day and the next, where's my orange tree? Where's my oranges? And then I assume this, again, I didn't Google it, but I assume that when the tree looks like it shouldn't be able to make oranges, it still won't make oranges. It takes a little while, right? Am I right? Anyone know? Can you give me a thumbs up? You guys old lies, you don't even know. You're just making it up. <laughs> yeah, sure, it sounds good to me. Patience is hard. But the book of James, it starts in chapter 1, and it says this. It says, my brethren, count it all joy. Everyone say joy. Joy. We started today with joy. We love joy. Anyone here love joy? Joy is awesome. Joy is fun. Come on. You like joy? I love joy. But the book kind of takes the left turn that you don't expect. It says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I don't like trials. I don't like falling into trials. This doesn't really line up. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, here's the word again, patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Anybody here want to be perfect? Don't lie. You all should be raised hand. You all want to be perfect. All right, let me ask you this. How many of you want your spouse to be perfect? Oh, there it is. <laughs> How many? And you may be perfect, complete. How many of you would like to lack nothing? Lack nothing. But be patient. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How can we be patient in hard times? How can we be patient? hard times. I want to go back to where we started. Hebrews chapter 12. You can put that up. Hebrews chapter 12. It says this. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. A weight is a distraction. Did you know that? It's not a sin. We have sin, but we have a weight. There's so many distractions in life that we pick up that we just need to put back down. Lay aside every weight, every distraction, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the, here's the word again, who for the joy, everyone say joy, Joy. 
who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the cross with joy. How did he do with joy? He knew his mission. He knew his purpose. He knew what God had called him to do. And I tell you this, that hard times are going to come. It's not always going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to be really hard. And you're going to feel like that farmer who's waiting for the orange. And you're like waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. But you, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the joy comes. Come on. The joy comes when you know what your mission and purpose is. God, you've got a greater plan for my life. I know what's, what's waiting for me on the other side. I know the rewards you have for me. And I'm okay putting up with a little bit of pain right now because I know the difference that I'm making. Am I speaking to anybody this morning? Come on. Am I speaking to anybody? I can't say this enough. You are extraordinary. You are incredible. And God has a specific, beautiful plan and purpose for your life. Do not get distracted. Do not look at other people, but run your race. Amen? We've got to have every head bowed, every eye closed right now. I want to talk to you for a moment. I want to talk with you for a moment here. I want to give you this opportunity as we talk to check out your heart and evaluate your heart and ask yourself, have I been running my race? Maybe I've been running somebody else's race or maybe I haven't been running at all. Maybe you've picked up a couple 45 pound plates, put them in your backpack. You've got all these distractions just weighing you down. You can't even run if you wanted to. check your heart right now. Say, Lord, what am I doing? Am I running my race? And if not, this is your, an opportunity here right now. Say, Lord, I, I'm sorry. I repent. I haven't been running my race. I've been distracted. I've been running somebody else's race, maybe. But Lord, I want to choose right now to make the conscious decision to run the race that you have set before me. I won't look to the left or the right. I will run my race. In this moment right now, make that decision. Say, Lord, I run my race. Lord, I run my race. Lord, I'll run my race. I'm going to get running. I'm going to lay aside every weight, every distraction, everything that's causing me to get my eyes off of you. Lord, I'm going to keep my eyes on you and I'm going to run my race. And if that's you right now, just say, just in your own heart, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything like that, but just take this moment and say, God, God, it's you. I choose you. God, I choose you. I choose to recognize you. I choose to recognize your unique giftings and callings that you've put on my life, and I will run my race. So, Father God, I lift up every person in this place under the sound of my voice right now. And I thank you, Lord, that you put vision on the inside of them. You put passion on the inside of them. You put the race on the inside of them. You show them their unique purpose. You show them their unique plan right now under the sound of my voice as they're listening. You just put it in their heart. This is what I've called you to do. And, Lord, we choose to run the race you have set before us in Jesus name if you agree say amen amen here we're gonna we're gonna take this moment right now we're gonna pray for anybody who needs prayer here this morning you're welcome to stay standing you're welcome to stay seated but just stay in the presence of God we're gonna take a moment here and talk through a couple scriptures and lay a foundation before we we lay hands on anybody I want to say this that sickness pain and disease it entered the world through sin There was no sickness in the Garden of Eden before Adam sinned. But we know that Jesus Christ bore all of our problems, all of our sickness, all of our pain on the cross, which we received as a result of sin. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin. Galatians 3.13 says, But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law, which when he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoings. So I want to quickly read this story here out of Mark chapter 2. 
says several days later, Jesus returned to Capernaum, and the news of his arrival spread quickly through the town. Soon the house was packed where he was staying. Sorry, let me say that again. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there wasn't room for one more person. I tell you what, the people were hungry to be around Jesus. And it's a good place to be, to be hungry to be around Jesus. I'm going to cram in there. I'm going to get in there. It doesn't matter what because I need to be with Jesus. I need to be in the presence of God. Are any of you here this morning hungry? Are you hungry for the things of God? Are you hungry for the things of God? It was so packed with visitors that there wasn't room for one more person, not even outside the door. And Jesus, he preached God's word to them. So then four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. I guess they showed up late. (laughs) Whoops. And they couldn't get to Jesus. They couldn't get to Jesus through the crowd. So they did something crazy. They dug a hole through the roof above his head. Man, they just had to be around Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the roof apart. I'm going to get to be with Jesus. Are you hungry this morning, family? Are you hungry this morning, family? They pulled the roof apart and they lowered the sick man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Boom. Came down. And now watch this. Pay attention here. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My son, your sins are forgiven. It didn't look like the man needed forgiveness. It looked like he needed healing. He was on a stretcher. But Jesus didn't pray for him to be healed. He said, your sins are forgiven you. Seeing their faith, seeing their belief, he said, your sins are forgiven. And then, of course, you get some of these religious people. He said, but And some of the religious, some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there said to themselves, What? This is blasphemy. Who but God can forgive sins? And Jesus knew what they were discussing amongst themselves. So he said to them, Why do you think this is blasphemy? Pay attention here. Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or get up, pick up your mat, and walk? In other words, there's no difference. There's no difference. If you are forgiven, you are healed. They were both purchased at the same time by Jesus Christ when he hung on that cross and he died on that cross. He paid for your forgiveness and he paid for your sin and he paid for your healing at the exact same moment in time. It's the same price. It's the same gift. The gift is one gift. It's not two gifts. It's one gift. Your salvation, your forgiveness, and your healing is one gift. Jesus said, I will prove to you that I, the Son of Man, have the authority on earth to forgive sins. Now watch this. I will prove that I have the authority to forgive sins. Watch what he says. Watch how he proves it. Then Jesus turns to the paralyzed man and he says, stand up, take your mat, and go on home because you are healed. The man jumped up, took the mat, and pushed his way through the crowd, through the stunned onlookers. (laughs) <laughs> they were stunned. They were stunned. We serve a good God. Then they all praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this before. So Jesus, he proved to the Pharisees that he could forgive sins. How did he prove it? Because he was forgiven, he had the right to be healed. Say this. Say, because I'm forgiven, I have the right to be healed. Now say it this way. Say, if he wasn't forgiven, he wouldn't have been healed. But because he believes in Jesus, he was forgiven and healed. Jesus saw his faith. He saw his belief. And when he saw that, he was forgiven and he was healed. Amen. I'll tell you one more story on that. Luke chapter 17. We know the ten lepers. They saw Jesus walking down the road, and they said, Son of David, have mercy on us. And did Jesus pray for them? If you look at Luke 17, he didn't pray for them. He said, 
He saw them. The Bible said he had compassion on them. So he, all he said was, go show yourself to the priests. And as they walked, they were healed. He didn't pray, nothing. It was their belief. When we believe in Jesus, we are forgiven and we are healed. They walked. The ten were healed. One came back and said, thank you. Amen? Okay, so as we're about to pray, I want to share two stories. And this first story, I, I want to be honest, I did not want to share this first story, but God just kept putting in my heart all week. And, and I just don't, I don't really want to share it, but I know I need to share it, so bear with me. And there was a lady in our church several years ago who had cancer, and it was terminal. And I was asked to go pray for her in the hospital. So I went to pray for her, and as I remember being in that hospital room, laying hands on her, and as I began to pray, I felt the Holy Spirit unction me and say, stop and ask her if she has any unforgiveness in her heart. So I asked her, I said, ma'am, do you have any unforgiveness in your heart? And she goes, no, I don't. No, I don't. Okay, okay. So I start praying, and as I start praying again, I just feel like I need to, no. Like, so I asked again, ma'am, do you have unforgiveness in your heart? She said, no, there's nobody I need to forgive. So I prayed. A week later, she passed away. Now, sometime, I never connected these before yesterday. Sometime later, I prayed for a lady. It was one of these Sundays. Apostle Theo had the, the pastors praying, and, and he wasn't praying. And I remember I was standing right here by this pole, and this lady came up to me. I happened to be the, the person that I prayed with. She said, I need prayer. I said, what do you need prayer for? She goes, oh, I've got stage four cancer, and the doctors have given me just weeks to live, maybe, maybe a couple months at best. So I said, okay, we're going to pray. So I begin praying, and as I begin praying, I feel the Lord tell me, ask her if she has unforgiveness in her heart. And I'm sure sometimes that happens if you've seen Apostle Theo. I mean, sometimes when you're praying, God will speak to you and say, ask this person this. So I asked her, do you have unforgiveness? And she goes, is there anybody you need to forgive? And she goes, actually, there is. I said, okay, tell them right now, I forgive you. And I promise as she spoke, I forgive you. And mentioned that person's name. The power of God hit her and she just fell out. I didn't pray. She came to me. Actually, she texted me a few weeks later. She was from out of town. I think she lives two hours away. She texted me two weeks later. Said she just got a PET scan and she was completely healed. Not one single trace of cancer in her body. <laughs> completely healed. It's God. Yeah. You're good. Come on, just tell him he's good. She's come back every, every couple of years. She comes back. I see her. She pops in. Every time I see her, I go, tell me the report. She goes, there's no cancer. Cancer's never come back in her body. So as I was preparing yesterday, it just hit me. The scripture, Matthew 6, 13, where Jesus said, if you refuse to forgive your brother, neither will your father in heaven forgive you. And our forgiveness and our healing is connected. Too many believers have unforgiveness in their heart. And I believe God had me share this because there's somebody here today, there's somebody here that has unforgiveness in their heart towards somebody and you need to let it go. That unforgiveness is holding you back. That unforgiveness is holding you back. So before we pray, I want to take this moment. I want you to just search your heart right now. If you need to close your eyes, if you need to bow your heads, but search your heart right now and say, Lord, is there anybody that I've got unforgiveness in my heart towards? Is there anybody? And we're going to release it right now. Are you willing to release it? It's hard. When you have unforgiveness towards somebody, it's hard to release it. But it starts with a decision. It's not easy, but you say, I choose to forgive this person. I choose. God, help me. I need a lot of help on this one. But God, I choose to forgive. So in this moment right now, if there's anybody you have unforgiveness towards, I want you to say this. Say, Lord, I forgive, and say their name. Lord, I forgive, whatever the name is. Amen. Okay, with that, let's pray. Is there anybody here that has pain, that has sickness, disease, anything in their body right now that you need prayer for? If that's you, stand up right now, wherever you are in this building. We're going to pray. Amen.
If you need healing, come on forward. Come on forward. We're going to pray. You're good. You go ahead and sing, Amanda. You're good. You're good. Come on, church, sing it. Cause you are. You're good. You're good. You are. You're good. Oh, you are. You're good. Come forward if you need prayer. Come forward. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, sir. What are you believing for here today? I have my back. Your back? Your back pain? Uh-huh. Okay. And also my breathing. And your breathing? Yes, sir. How bad is the pain on, in your back? How, how bad is the pain? Very painful. On a scale of 1 to 10. On a scale of 1 to 10. Is it 10? 10 out of 10? It's, it's bad. Okay. We're going to pray. I know Pastor Theo, he prayed for you a couple weeks ago. Did he, did he measure your legs? Were your, were your legs uneven? Okay, okay we'll, we'll do the chair again. Let's, let's get that chair. I'll come right back to you. Okay. Amen. What do you, what do you believe him for here this morning? Okay. 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 How bad is the pain right now? Okay. Okay. See the pain. Can we do the chairs now? Help me. Give me some direction. All right. Let's do this. We're going we're gonna to pray for these two first, and we'll, we'll come right back to you, okay? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Sir, you want to sit in the chair? Come sit in this chair over here. Thank you, Jesus. All right. I'm going to measure your legs. We're going to see how, how your legs are doing now, okay? Can I have your legs? Can I have your feet? All right. Can I have the other one? see them here. Can you see that in the camera? We got that? It's a little uneven. So we're going to speak to the leg, the short leg, and we're going to tell it to grow, okay? In the name of Jesus, leg grow. There it comes. There it comes. Did you feel that? You see that? There's a little, a little quarter inch there. A little, 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 little bitty. You feel that though? Lord Jesus, stay there. <laughs> stay here, stay here. Heavenly Father, right now, I thank you, Lord, for your healing anointing to flow through his body from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. We speak to that pain and we command it to go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you are forgiven. Amen. Tell us, where's the pain? How's it feel? Test it out. It's gone. It's gone. Can we have the microphones? Tell everybody, what did Jesus do? He healed me. Where's the pain? It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> Give God praise. Give God praise. You feel great. Amen. Go rejoicing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, ma'am, you want to sit in the chair? I'm going to pray for you, too. The pain's going to go. Okay. 
Isn't God good? It's all Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can I see your legs? Can I measure your legs? Let's see how they're doing here. Okay. We can keep them together right here. Okay. You guys see that? My head out the way. All right. Ma'am, take a look. Do this. I want you to speak to your legs and tell your legs to grow. 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 There it goes. Grow. It's growing. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There it comes. There it comes. There it comes. <laughs> Hallelujah. All the way. How, where's the pain? You feel that? Where do you feel that? All over my body. All the way, all over your body. Where's the pain? Why don't you stand up? Tell us where the pain is. Stand up. Stand up. Test your leg. Test, test, your, test your body. Let's test it out. Where's the pain? It's going, it's going. It's going? It's going, it's going. Where's it at? It's going. It's going. It's going. It's gone. It's gone. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> God is good. You are good. You're good. All right, what's going on? A hernia. Is there pain right now? There's no pain. If you push on it, is there pain? Okay. So I'm going to pray for you. Now I want to hear you come back and tell us. It's healed, okay? Where, where's the hernia? Can you push on it? Right. Not really. Okay. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your healing anointing. In Jesus' name. Receive now. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's gone. It's gone. What do you believe him for? Your wrist. Does it hurt? On a scale of one to ten. A ten? Does it hurt when you move it more? Okay. Have your hand. What do you believe is going to happen today? God's going to heal you. Okay. According to your faith, receive right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, test it out. Where's the pain? There's no pain. It's gone. Can you tell everybody what did Jesus do for you? He healed me. Can you look at look at the camera right here? He healed me. Where was the pain? It was 10 out of 10 before? In my wrist? Yeah. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. What was it before? It was a 10. <laughs> tell everyone, Jesus healed me. Look at the camera. Say, Jesus healed me. Jesus healed me. Amen. Amen. Michelle, what do you need prayer for? Okay. When the pain comes, uh, I start to get feverish. Okay. Okay. He's healing you right now. Receive it right now. He's healing you right now. In the name of Jesus, receive now. Receive now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There it is. There it is. There it is. Receive now. There it is. What are you believing for, sir? Uh, healing from diabetes. Diabetes? And, also just a heart issue. and a heart issue. Okay. What do you believe is going to happen when we pray today? You're going to be healed? According to your faith, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, just for overall. Go where the knife of man cannot go, and you correct and you bring healing, you've already paid for it, in Jesus' name. There it is. Amen. I want to hear the good report. Let us know. Let us know. What's going on? Migraines. 
You have migraine now? What's, where's the pain at right now? Hey, you know, God healed me from migraines. I used to have horrible migraines until I was around 12, 13. And Rodney Hal Brown prayed for me. I have never had a migraine since. But what's going to happen when I pray for you today? You're going to get healed. The pain's going to go. It's never going to come back. In the name of Jesus, receive now. In the name of Jesus. Receive it in Jesus' name. Okay, where's the pain? Oh, you're going, okay. <laughs> we'll bring him back to earth in a minute. I want to hear. All right, let's come over here. All right, man, what are you believing for? Hmm? You believe in God? What do you need prayer for? Okay. Psalm. Is there pain? There is. Okay. Where's the pain at right now? On a scale of one to ten, how bad? How bad is it? You don't feel any pain right now. Okay. We're gonna pray. What do you believe is gonna happen when we pray? going to happen. God's going to heal you. Do you believe he's going to heal you? Okay. Let's pray. According to your faith, I thank you, Lord, for your healing anointing to flow through her body right now from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, receive it now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say, I receive it. Amen. All right, ma'am. What do you believe in for? Healing for your brother. Okay. Okay. What's his name? Robert. I thank you, Lord, as we lay hands on this cloth right now, Lord, that your power goes into this cloth. And I thank you, Lord, whatever Robert needs, Lord, you know what he needs. And I thank you, Lord, your healing anointing is on this cloth. And as it is laid upon him, he receives it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right, let's. How's the headache? What? Isn't there? Where'd it go? It's gone. It's gone. The healing's gone. The pain's gone. It's gone. And it's never coming back. It's never coming back. It's never coming back. Thank you, Jesus. But one more time, family. You're never going to let me down. You are good. You're good. Come on, church. Oh, one more time. You are good. You're good. You're good. Amen. Amen.